It was sort of like layers of fear and anxiety. A giant sort of grab you by the shoulders as a country and as people and, you know, wake you up to stuff that you didn't know was there. We survived because we were good enough to learn and adapt and strong enough to stay in the game. Don Valido is a leader. She runs several of our restaurants, including our flagship founding farmers on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC. She's one of the most passionate and engaged operators I have ever worked with. I was able to sit down with Dawn, enjoy a drink, take a deep breath, and have a candid conversation about what it has taken to survive the COVID pandemic in the restaurant industry. First of all. Cheers. If anybody deserves a drink, it's you. <laughs> I wanted us to talk today because we don't get a lot of time to talk. We do a lot of work. We solve a lot of problems. We worry about a lot of problems that we can't solve. We don't really sit down and have a drink very often together. Maybe ever. As you even think about the conversation that we're about to have, what's going through your mind? Do I really want to go all the way back? and think through it. Um, I would say, how do you ever pick one year of your life and say that it was the most difficult? Um, but I think for me, certainly for our business, hard to imagine one being harder than this one was. So what did you do with worrying about you and worrying about the team? Went to work. To work. Um, you know, we made, I made some dramatic changes in my personal um, life because all of us lost our income. Um, as gently and empathetically as I possibly could, I shared the bad news and, you know, made the only promises at the time that we could make, uh, which was we want you back the minute we can bring you back and we're going to feed you every day until then. Um, and then we, you know, mobilized uh, resources for how to file for unemployment, where to go for help, what to do if you're hungry, what to do if you can't pay your, first of all, come get food from us if you're hungry, what to do if you can't pay your rent. And I think, um, you know, for me, I just transitioned into full on. I'm going to, I'm going to find a way through for everybody. What I think people probably don't have a lens into or don't understand is that we're at that table making decisions as executives. And then you get up from that table and you go implement that decision as a frontline worker, right? It's not some executive committee in some office that says we're gonna lay off a thousand people and then somehow it happens somewhere else. Like I think about when we got up from that table and we knew we had to go to each restaurant and tell the managers and tell the teams and we thought well how do we do this at this and we needed to get the message out to everybody and we wanted to do it in person and i remember i had promised you i'll i'll get to the moco restaurant i know that team so that needs one of downtown. us so that you could go downtown and then i think i stayed and did some conversations at tyson's and i was late getting to moco and I mean, I remember what was going through my head, which is my people, our people need me there. And I can't be in all of those places. And the conversations were just awful. People don't get it. You know, they think you eliminate a thousand jobs. They don't realize that. That sounds like some big company right. action step. <clears throat> it, it wasn't, it was our families. And what about sending your daughter into harm's way every day as a restaurant manager? It was scary. And I remember the first um, employee that tested positive and, and then, you know, every sneeze, every cough, every headache, you think, oh my God, do I have COVID? And that was a crappy way to feel and work every day, but we did it. I, I was amazed with what with what you did through the whole thing. We used to say about our business, we're not saving lives, right? Don't get stressed, nobody's gonna die. Uh, 
And then we lost the luxury of being able to say that, right? And we knew that we were asking people to come to work, some with you know other complicating factors, some who take care of their grandma, some who might yeah. be a little overweight, some who, all, any of these characteristics that might have made it worse. And we asked them to keep coming. And we figured things out. You created a new business, the market and grocery, all, you know, chocolate, all of these new things. So while we're going through the hard stuff and you're leading the teams through this hard stuff, you're also inventing, creating, innovating, doing new stuff, the Every launch. Every single employee learned a new job. Every single one, I was thinking about that. Every single one of us learned how to do a different job that we had never done before. So is that the silver lining? I mean, what what's the... I would say the silver, I mean, the. so the first silver lining is we kept everybody's jobs, right? We yeah. survived. Mm -hmm. um, our employees are back to work. We're hiring. That's a silver lining. We learned, um, we reminded ourselves by doing it that we're survivors. I think that's a silver lining. And I think um, all of the, all the tools we had to find to be successful with the market, with curbside to go, with the unpredictability of the business, with bringing people back to work into jobs that they didn't know how to do without really the luxury of time to train or training materials for new jobs for that matter. Um, I think we we learned we learned what it what we really can do. And so um, it's interesting because I would say there won't ever be a time again when we're afraid of change. But actually, I think we're still all yearning for a, a, a slowdown of all the change. Some stability, some stability, some normalcy, some, you know, the the we learned what we can do. And we also learned what happens when you have to push so hard for so long. I hear people say, well, you know, yeah, it's been difficult, but we've learned a lot. Companies now are stronger or, you know, there've been all these lessons learned. It's been difficult. I'm glad it happened. Yeah, you're not gonna get me to say I'm glad it happened. I, I don't know how, how we could ever say I'm glad it happened. I mean, sure we learned, maybe we come out better, but not glad it happened. It sucked yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for everyone. Yeah. And the silver lining is how you go forward, but don't pretend that, for me, I would never pretend and say, oh, I'm glad it happened, we learned so much and now we're gonna be better than ever. We'll be better than ever because we survived. Yeah. We survived because we were good enough to learn and adapt and strong enough to stay in the game. You think about 2020, I know a lot of folks talk about COVID as the big story. You know, I don't see it that way. I think it is a year of humanity, hard stuff, justice, awakenings, illness, um, a giant sort of grab you by the shoulders as a country and as people and, you know, wake you up to stuff that you didn't know was there. What, what do you think of all of the teams are people that you talk to? people would put on their list as the hardest thing they dealt with in 2020? Well, all of the, the protests and political unrest, um, it was sort of like layers of fear and anxiety as if COVID wasn't enough. When you think about the diners, how do you break it down between the diners that you really love and the diners that reveal themselves to be the worst of humanity? Because I know we see it. We see it. We, we deal with it. Um, I would so much rather talk about the diners who saved our business just like we did. Um, the challenge is when you're working in such challenging times, there's so much to be 
cautious of, fearful of, careful. Um, one, one guest who is uh, disrespectful, racist, um, condescending, judgmental from a personal perspective. Look, it's one thing if your salad's made wrong, your salad's made wrong and we should make it right. If you think it's okay to say that your salad's made wrong because your server's Hispanic, it's not okay. And we hear that sometimes and it can derail a young, a young manager having to deal with a guest like that. It, it takes you out for the whole, the whole shift. It's tough. It's really tough. And it seemed like, it seemed like this, that, this last year, it was like kind of feast or famine because we got the best of the best guests who, who saved us with their loyalty and saved us with their patience and their kindness and their frequency. And then guests who were kind of like, we don't really care what the world is going through. We're just here to shit on you. And um, it's hard to coach a young manager team through that. And you know, recognize the hardship that all of it put on everybody. Um, Tell me about one family here, one of your chefs, someone on the team that you saw them have to adapt with kids at home, the demands of work, the fear of the virus. Oh, our chef, um, our chef at Pennsylvania Avenue, her whole family works for us. And uh, they live in a community, um, several families in, in her house with her children. And on the day of the layoffs, I laid off her entire family except for her and reduced her pay by 75% at least. Um, and I watched her nephew show up for work in those early days and refused to leave and want to work without pay. I watched her juggle and figure it out. And um, the gratitude from, from, the, from them when, when they come back, I can remember which I was on the phone with Laura, one of our amazing support people. And um, I just burst into tears and said, I feel so guilty because I get to go to work. Um, and those were the days when we didn't have anybody back. The managers were cooking. We only had salaried employees. We were cooking to go. We didn't, I don't think we had our online ordering system yet, if that was even possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I said that to her and, you know, she says, I feel so helpless. What can I do? And it, it, it's the juggling of all that. And then, so when they come back and, and there's all that gratitude, it feels very misplaced. Right, I'm th I should be thanking them yeah. for for hanging in there, for making it, for getting through it with all of us. And I and I can tell you that the teams we have back, they're bonded in a way that just doesn't even happen in everybody's lifetime. I know we have amazing stories. I know we have hard stories. Um, were you ever mad at me? Sure. Um, I got mad at you a lot. I, I would say I had a I had a routine. <laughs> My anger had a routine. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason I haven't asked you <laughs> this before. Um, it was, you know, we were uh, we were pushed. I would say to our limits, figuring out the transition to the market because thank goodness our guests love us enough that they started ordering twenty thousand dollars or more on day one. Um, but we didn't know what we were doing. And so we were figuring it out. And um, I could count on you guys as soon as I thought I almost had something figured out to change it. And that was frustrating, really frustrating. Um, but then we'd win, right? Then we did a $40,000 market day. Maybe that was because of the changes you made, maybe not. Um, I think because we were able to keep winning, I was able to have short-term anger um, and recognize, you know, there were times where I would hang up the phone or read the email or whatever it was and just be like, those fuckers have no <coughs> idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but look, I'm, I'm, I am, <clears throat> I'm immature enough to still let myself have those emotions. 
and I am also, I was passionate enough to then go and think. And many times I thought to myself, okay, would I rather be pulling the strings or getting punched in the face by the other puppet? Um, and look, the, the weight of the responsibility that I know you guys felt because of what I watched us do Probably your feet didn't probably hurt as bad as mine did, but certainly I can't imagine that your head didn't. Um, because, look, I just had to take the mission and figure it out. I didn't have to write the playbook, and none of us really knew which playbook was going to work. So the, I had a, my anger could slip away under the the responsibility to figure out how to do it. I think was very different than figuring out what to do. You know, the rest of society was like washing down their groceries. Remember that phase? Oh, yeah. And like dividing their counter and like putting their delivered groceries on one side and doing the other. And we were asking you and the teams to come to work and be the people working side by side. Look, we were we were all grateful to be working. And the <clears throat> kind of one of the cool things about it was the people who wanted to work there was a brief period of time where nobody, none of our hourly employees got to work and our managers did. But when it started, when we started to get some momentum and some revenue, the people who wanted to work got to work. So one of the little silver linings was there was a time where the whole team was people who really wanted to be here. And as you know, when a whole team really wants right. something. Amazing things happen, right? Everybody wants happen. to be there. Everybody All gets through it. All of a sudden it. they figure it out without a training manual, mm -hmm. without clear direction, without, you know. We had masks, we had sanitizer, and we had cleaning supplies all the time. There's pretty much nothing else that we had an unlimited supply of. We had to figure it out. What fills your cup? What puts your wind in the sails? You know, what, what really gets you up tomorrow ready to get after it again? Our people and our guests. Th that's easy. That answer has been the same for me for more years than I care to admit. Um, our guests have been unbelievably loyal, patient, generous, um, and look, we have, I, I could spend an hour telling you how even our guests themselves have come up with new ways to support us. And so, f especially for the teams in the restaurants, those regular guests that in the beginning showed up to buy burgers and then showed up for their market order and then hand sewed masks at home because they were worried that we were going to run out and then bought sanitizer by the case and shipped it to all of their friends and relatives and drove from, you know, my sister drove from Annapolis every Saturday for six months to pick up groceries for anybody she could con into ordering from us because she felt helpless and it was the way she knew how to help. And while we're getting all that support, we're like, crashing on Mother's Day and screwing things up and making oh, mistakes. When I think of all the guests who probably ordered groceries from us in the beginning and we were so there's, incompetent. There's no, we didn't even know how incompetent we were. And I think of, you know, the ways that the guest that, you know, gets this ginormous carrot instead of they see a picture on our website of this nice little bag of you know young carrots right <laughs> instead we send them this carrot that must have been in the ground for 10 years <laughs> and you can't cut with your best chef knife and instead of them being like what the f is this they put a picture on the internet and say tell you they hope we never stop doing that right the absolute worst operational covid day was mother's day last year I don't know. That was the day that I, I don't, did I ever show you the note? We were, <laughs> we, we were running out of things so fast that I had Emily, I was like, Emily, get a computer and come here right next to me. I'm like, type this. Dear sir or madam, we are so sorry. We're overwhelmed by our Mother's Day volume. <laughs> you may not be getting anything that you ordered. <laughs> but you will get something? 
Right. I have, it was something like we've selectively replaced the items that were out of in your order. We're sorry. We didn't have the ability to contact you. And I can assure you that the items that, you know, anything they got wrong, we kept a list of the name and what we didn't send them and we refunded. It was insanity. And Emily's like, Dawn, you really want me to put that in all the bags? And I was like, mm -hmm. no, not all the bags, <laughs> just the ones that aren't right. And then she's like, I think it's like all the bags because there was five or six there. And I said, yeah, I mean, it was crazy. It's like, if you order crab cakes, you got shrimp bucatini. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was so bad. It was so awful. We ran out of all the sides. We bought frozen peas from Paris Teeter. <laughs> And that was the only side you could get. I mean, it was, it was like, it couldn't have gotten, it was a failure at its worst. And we were all trying so hard. Sometimes you just have to tell the guests we're human, we're a it's mess, what I said. this is hard, it's food, we're trying. Shut up and eat, I hope you're not allergic. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All of those stories, the, the feedback and the, you know, just the all I could go on and on with all the guest stories and on the ways that um, that they've supported us. That's it's why we're still in business. And it makes all of us so proud to know that um, we really are a part of our communities. And yeah, they want their fried chicken and waffles because if we do it right and we actually put it in the bag, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> But they, 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 they took us maybe not at our best for a while. And that's, that's just, it's just wonderful. It's a good, it's why we're, it's why we're in this business. So Dan, how hard was it for you and Mike to make strategic decisions about spending in the interest of our future while knowing that our teams were still judging us for not getting everyone back to work, getting salaries back to normal. I, I sometimes found it hard to answer their questions. I did, because I understood it, but I think hearing it from you is different. Yeah, you know, I can explain it as saying we're, I believed in the future. I didn't think that we had one piece of bread left. It was our last piece of bread and we had to divide it evenly, believing that there would be no more bread for anyone. I had those thoughts. It was miserable. I got through that first phase of thinking, what if there's no future? And I said, fuck that. We are going to make a future. And so I knew that if we didn't spend some of the money we had planning for the future, strengthening the company, if we didn't use some of our money for what was important but not urgent, that we would regret it. And so looking our team in the eye or asking you to look our team in the eye on my behalf if I wasn't there, there's no good way to have that conversation because it's still personal, right? You're asking people to work for, for very little money while they're seeing you spend money on something else. All I can say is fast forward to where we are now. And I think that the strategy has proven out because the same team that we asked to work for so little is the team that needs more resources and support right now. And if we had fallen so far behind with support services or technology or safety um, or marketing ability and guest communications ability, had we fallen so far behind, it would be even worse now. And sometimes leadership is about seeing the mountain that's after the one in front of you, even though you know everybody's just focused on the one in front of them. And you, you have to somehow think about, I gotta save a little something and spend a little something for what's next because there will be what's next. So that's, 
that's how I thought at the time, and that's that's still how I reflect on it now. Do you have any regrets? I do. I think we could have done more for some of our people who were suffering the most. My regret is not being more intentional about going out there and, and somehow finding out about everybody's hardship and doing more to solve it. Um, I, I know the impact of trauma on people. And so when I think there is a chance to have reduced some of it or prevented some of it, uh, I will always second guess myself and judge myself and think I could have done more. For the rest of it, the tactical decisions, uh, what we did, what we communicated, who we chose to support, what we chose to communicate about our values, what we did with safety, all of the big, the big obvious issues from 2020. And this year, I think um, our team's pretty fucking awesome. I concur. <laughs> so what's the future? Like, where are we now? Where are we going? I would say we have this core team of um, family. There's, no, there's nothing else to call them. And I would include our employees and, and guests. There's like this, I think we came out of COVID with this, with the kind of strength that only comes from, you know, our industry equivalent of surviving a war, right? And so we will get back to capacity. The, our guests are telling us every day they want us back at capacity. Um, and the silver lining is we learned how to do patios and do them well. And our guests decided it's not so bad to sit out there. So when we're, when we're really back to 100% capacity, we're going to be better and bigger, actually, than ever. More seats, more loyal guests employees that we would do anything for and have done anything for us. And, um, you know, Mike can start updating the menus and, and all the things we've learned how to do are going to be here to stay, I think. And that's cool. And it's fun. And we're all going to get to, you know, go on vacation and, and kind of find a better normal. I can't think of a better way for us to go forward than to schedule our next cocktail together and say, we're not gonna have to unpack anything. We're just gonna have a drink. That's right. Celebrate on behalf of our team and our guests and our farmers and know we not only got through it, but we got somewhere new and awesome and the future's bright. Yeah, it is for sure.